Right. Guys, welcome back to the School of Calisthenics. Question and answer number five. five, which is exciting. We've been going through a load of comments. Dave has been pulling together the best of those. So what have we got today? Well, make sure you click subscribe so you don't miss out. And then if you have any other questions yourself, put them in the comments below and we will get into them next time. But for now, Tim, we're kicking things off with Peter Ellis from, uh, he was on YouTube. And he said, great video. So he starts, he start, he starts his question. Sure well. way to get there. Get yourself yeah. um, Can you please explain time under tension in the speech marks and where it should be included in calisthenics training? Cheers, lads. Yeah, this is going to feed into another question I think we're going to address in a minute. But we talk about time under tension a lot and it's a bit of a technical strength and condition term. And that what, we're, what we're talking about ultimately is how much time a muscle is under tension for during the duration of a rep or a set or an exercise. So if we're doing uh, an exercise at different tempos, we do that to get a different adaptation. So if it's more like an eccentric loader, so if we're looking for some hypertrophy, increasing muscle mass, what we're trying to do is keep that muscle under tension for longer. So we put those under, uh, we would talk about those as a tempo being a four, two, one. So four second eccentric, two second isometric, and a one second. Uh, concentric movement, which gives a total time under tension of seven seconds. Just doing the math on that. <laughs> I didn't know as well. If it was a power exercise, we would write it in the tempo, it would be XXX, which basically means as fast as possible. We're not really worried about time under tension. The more important thing in that situation is that the movement is explosive as fast as possible. So your muscle up might be XXX. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You don't try it unless you're going to go for a real strict, slow, controlled muscle. We're not too worried. And again, it's thinking about why do we use time and attention? What exercise is that more appropriate for? And we're going to come on to some isometric chat in a minute, so follow on for that because it's, we'll, we'll flesh this out a little bit more. But essentially, depending what adaptation we want, depending what we want the muscle to respond to, uh, or the system to respond to, we're going to change the time and attention accordingly. Yeah. Um, so, like using the muscle up as an example, so when Tim's talking about eccentrics and isometrics and concentric, it's like if you imagine a squat, the first part, you where you go down, the eccentric, the isometric might be a pause at the bottom or you might not do a pause at all, and then the concentric is on the way up. So, like that muscle up being, if, when we're doing it fast and explosive, it's just XXX as fast as you can, but we might use um, an, an, an eccentric muscle up where you're just doing the downward phase and we might do like, we might be trying to keep that like five seconds on the way down so yeah, yeah. Um, the that, important thing that we sort of and we miss out sometimes ourselves and we try to get across to people is the, the importance of time and attention when you're trying to get to build strength whether it's a, as an isometric as an eccentric lower or the concentric actually pushing out we need to create tension in the muscle for it to adapt if, if we're not creating any um, tension and we're just doing momentum we're not going to get strong so I saw someone the other day was doing some um, like kipping pull-ups in, um, uh, in, in the gym and, and someone I was with had never really seen them before and was like, what is that all about? And the idea for them in, the, in CrossFit when they're doing kipping pull-ups is do as many as you can. So they're using as much momentum as possible to make the exercise as easy as possible so they can do as many reps as they can. And that's just the outcome that yep. they're after. Are you going to build loads of strength doing that? Probably not because you're using momentum rather than creating tension. So it's just a different, it depends what the outcome you're after. In calisthenics, particularly when we do go, we'll just go into this in the isometrics and we're trying to um, build strength for holds, we can't use momentum because we're not actually going to build that strength that we're after. Yeah, that fair point. And yeah. so, making sure when we're doing stuff, we're creating enough tension to create enough adaptation so the muscle is going to get stronger and we can do the stuff we're trying to do. It's actually a really difficult thing. It's one thing with tempo is one thing that, that people don't do well because it takes real discipline. So, the hypertrophy example I gave before of doing a four second eccentric. Imagine you're trying to build a little bit of muscle mass, you're going to pull up, so that'll be one second at the top, two seconds at the top, and four, three, two, one, on the way down. To be fair, that I takes some real discipline. Like, like, do you want to do ten of those on your pull-ups? Yeah, so it's really tough. hard. It's much easier to pull up and let yourself go back down. And I think there's an area where, for, for me personally, it's something yeah. I've been thinking about this week, um, and for a lot of people, you can if, get a lot more gains in your training if yeah. you actually paid a bit more attention to, to the time, how you're going about producing the movement and thinking about 
controlling it and spending a little bit more time controlling those positions. You're making me right now think about the tempos I'm going to use later when I train. Yeah, for but sure. We, we always come back to this basic principle of the specific specific adaptations in post around the body. You get what you train for, the body responds to the stress you place upon it. So if we're just bouncing pull ups out, maybe we can get 10, 12 of those, but we're trying to get stronger, is it more effective for us actually to do two seconds up, two seconds down, increase the time on attention? There's a long argument there, there's lots of discussions to get into it, but something to think about, about actually being a bit more disciplined with how we're going about producing the movement. And ultimately that links into the response from the muscles, the amount of time the muscle spends on attention. I think the last thing on that you made me think about is that if you're paying attention to like your tempos and the time of the tension, the other thing you're also doing is working through really good range, yeah. which we see, I've done in the past before myself, and made that mistake and we see it with people where you're actually not going for the full range of motion and then you wonder why you're not strong at the bottom part of your handstand push-up or yeah. the starting point of your muscle up. Um, I'll tell you what, I'm going to do, I'm going to do an experiment I'll let you know how I get on in a few weeks. I, I need to do a block of training, some basic kind of strength stuff. So yeah. I'm going to dip into this a little bit. I'm going to try and work a little bit time on attention, uh, increase that, be a bit more disciplined in my own training. I'll, we'll see how we get on. Yep. Cool. Great question. So that's going to lead us into our second question around a similar topic. Uh, this one actually came in via email um, from Dougie Black. Um, it says, do you practice... Uh, so he didn't start with a, a compliment, but he still gets on. Do you practice isometrics and do you think they are beneficial to calisthenics? So the whole sort of time and tension and isometrics thing is obviously going to be linked together. Feeding uh, quite well. Yes. Do you want me to kick off? Yeah, yeah. This is a, it's a, the short answer, which we never really give, is, a, is yes. Isometrics definitely got an important role in, a, in calisthenics, and we do definitely use them. A little bit of the background, so what we're talking about with an isometric is where we haven't, we've got the muscle at a static point. So the eccentric is where the muscle is lengthening, concentric where the muscle is shortening, and the, the isometric is that point where the muscle is not doing neither of those two things, it has a static point. So if we're pre performing a human flag, if we're performing a back lever or a front lever, that isometric position is, is where the muscle is holding you in a stable static shape. Um, the interesting thing about them for calisthenics is we're looking for very specific outcomes. So we're looking to hold isometric positions. That's a, 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 the whole point of a lot of these moves. Whereas if you're looking for isometrics to have an impact on parkour or rugby or hockey or whatever it might be, there's less of a, a role for that. So from an athletic perspective, when we're training the guys over the last however, eight, nine years, Isometrics come in and maybe a rehab setting, but we don't really train isometrics for sports performance that much because we're just looking to get the guys strong through range of movement because that's what they're going to have to do on the sports pitch. Whereas in calisthenics specific endeavor, isometrics has got a massive role. Yeah. So there's a little bit of work about how that fits in together. It links into the time under tension. We've made a mistake before, particularly around front lever training, where you try and pick a progression which is too hard. And when you Get pull it into it, we actually did it with human flags right at the start as well. Yes. When we teach human flags now, we're much more methodical about telling people. We had this workshop at the weekend, which was great in Ashbourne. But we were talking about having to pick a progression, an isometric hold, where you can actually get a decent amount of time on attention. So we would pull up into a front lever or into a human flag. We might get to just like kiss that end position for a second and then we're coming out of it. And you might do five or six of those. When you go home, you go, well, I've trained front lever today. We've actually only done six seconds of time on attention, maybe. And it's maybe a little bit ropey. Whereas if you strip it back a little bit and we go, let's do tuck positions or progressions, which are a little bit easier for us. And we're aiming for, for more time, like 10, 12, 13 seconds time on attention, five, six sets. Then we're starting to build up some more like, meaningful um, stimulus for the adaptation. So we might be getting 45 to 60 seconds worth of time on attention as opposed to the six seconds that we patted our backs out of the back of it. <laughs> this flag is not far away. Yeah. The reality is it would be much closer had we actually yeah. I think it's been one a bit more humble. And that's one of the dangers with the calisthenics is we get excited and we want to do the next, and I don't know if it is a male thing, because sometimes the, the females we get on the workshops are better, um, but it might be whether that is or not. It's a completely different discussion, but <laughs> we get excited and we want to do the next thing, we want to do the next thing, and. Um, I make the mistake all the time if we're always trying to do the next thing. It's too complicated or too difficult and not able to even, whether you can do it or create enough tension and you know, often even doing like five seconds yeah. feels like a long time. I'm counting my head really fast, so it's probably more like three. <laughs> yeah. And actually what I need to do is 10, so I need to, need to strip that back, I know yeah. myself. And, um, 
and, and, and focus point, on that a little that bit. point you make about guys and girls being different the reason is that the girls often just understand we have this phrase earn the right to progress and girls get that way more they go well, what's level one and they go we need to be held to hold this position for x amount of time they go i've got to do that there Whereas we were on a workshop, and I'm going to give uh, Phil Gording a shout out, actually, one of the guys, there's a trainer who came on a workshop at the weekend. And we went through all these progressions, and we hadn't said anything. He goes, right, literally, and goes, right, I'm going to go start at the top and work my way down from there. It's <laughs> literally, let's try and find the hardest thing and see if I can see where that I can go, rather than going, I'm just going to go from the bottom work up. So th there's been some nice work done on uh, equating isometric time under tension to percentage of rep max so normally when we're not when we're talking sort of like deadlifts or squats or whatever it might be we would say your 10 rep or your one rep max so the amount of weight you can lift for one rep and then that would be more like a max strength adaptation if we're going to go hypertrophy up using 10 reps so that would be a 70 percent of one rep max so 100 kilo back squat would be your one rm your 70% one RM would be 70 kilos, pretty simple. So if we equate that into isometric terms, you can kind of fit the same thing in as so a bit of work that's been done, which actually I think looks really good. And I think it's got some good uses to it. So if your maximum hold is say, I don't know, let's go 18 seconds, you could do something for once, then it might be that you then start to train nine, 12, 13 seconds, and you aim to do four to five sets of that. And then over that period of time, you're then starting to accumulate, as I said before, 45, 60 seconds worth of work, but it's relevant to what your maximal total is. Yeah. And that's the same approach we take for sports performance. If we're gonna try and work out train loads, test the one RM, or we often use a three RM, how much can you do for three reps, and then work off your rep ranges from that. So I'd probably I'd look at something, and aim, pick a progression which you can hold for, let's say 18 seconds, and then work between nine and 12 seconds, or whatever, if you yeah. maximum. So I think like a dead, uh, like a, just break it down to just the simplest idea of going, you want to create in your session 60 seconds yeah. worth of tension and like let's get an easy round number for everyone. Like if you can 10 seconds, yes. then that would mean you'd need six sets. So if you go in something like four to six sets and somewhere around 10 seconds yeah. for each of those, about two to three minutes rest in between, so you're getting good rest in between, so you can do those holes maximally. Uh, then you're going to be somewhere there or thereabouts. I actually tried this yesterday. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try and put, put a bit more time into getting this full planche position. So I was doing some planche took holds, and um, I was hitting sort of like 10, 11 seconds on those, and I did five sets. And then my last set, I couldn't hold it anymore. I was literally goose. But if I'd held that, my longest height to hold for one would have probably been 15, 16 seconds, I reckon. So that, I think, for me, as a, as a try and error, worked out really well yesterday. Yeah. And if you can't hold it, if you can't hold it for like 10, 10 minutes, then you just need to bring just adapt that in the progression uh, progression back, back whether yeah, you're changing yeah. a lever lane using a band or whatever it is that you decide to use yeah so we've definitely got a great role for calisthenics i think if you're going to get there you can do it without it is possible to do it but i think it's looking at the holistic way of training you're going to need a little bit of just general strength development but the isometrics is certainly a quicker way to get to that end point if yeah. you don't try and learn a front lever without an isometric i think you're going to have a real hard time so you get what you train for and take a message, pick an easier progression, generally for most of us particular pick an easier progression and spend longer time holding them. Yeah. Cool. Great. Now, next question. Oh, come on, you haven't called me Question Master yet. Um, uh, after, after last week, when your phone went in the middle of the, uh, the Q&A, I, I feel like you've been relegated. It's, you need a new one of those. I'm sucking it. Your phone too. would never have gone off. And right, Robinson well, would never have gone off. the next question. Off. Right, Question Master. Tell them what it is. Right. Uh, oh god, pick someone who's I don't I can't pronounce his name. This is one of my favourite things. The Q and A. Actually, yeah, like watching Dave almost for the first time, you'd be like trying to read it out. Like I, again, if I was question master, I would I would rehearse the name. Gerardo. So I'm right. not going to go for your surname, Gerardo, because <laughs> we're close like that. And he starts his question with great video, guys. So he knows what he's talking about. Um, uh, so. Uh, he feels better when he stretches before training sessions, but a lot of people say that it should be after. Uh, within the limited time most of us have to spend at the gym, what do you guys think about them? Uh, about them, like when you should uh, when you should stretch? I'm gonna let you Which I thought it was a great uh, question. Thank you, Tim. Um, so, when you're talking about, or the way what we do for our sort of movement prep, what we call movement preparation, for us it's not just about stretching; it's about what we call self myofascial release. But releasing muscle tension and trying to create better shape. So there's some, some studies and some good information out there about um, stretching, like static stretching, reducing the amount of power output a muscle can give, which 
if you are going to uh, try and do some maximal strength stuff or max power stuff where we did, might be doing muscle up say for instance and you've just stretched out your like lats and your pecs and then you're going to want them to act explosively then um, it could be detrimental but the way we look at it is um, we're not black or white between things it's very much a case of can if you can't create the shape you need to so for instance if you're wanting to work handstands and you can't or human flagging you can't create good overhead position then it's going to be beneficial for you to mobilize out your pecs your lats and actually stretch potentially or use some sort of mobility work that would potentially involve a stretch for a certain period of time where you can actually get into a better position then you're going to have more chance of being able to be strong in that position and hold yeah. the actual shape um, Stretching afterwards um, is something I would like to do, but I probably just, it's something I neglect personally and something I probably need to do a little bit more, but that's where time-wise comes in to me, they're just being restricted in that I'll do my preparation work, my mobility work at the beginning of the session to prep me for what it is I'm going to do. Um, like I say, if I'm going to go and do a load of handstands, I'll certainly make sure my overhead position is decent enough to be able to create that shape before I go, yeah. go into them. Yeah, I think from my perspective, again, we bring in the athlete population that we train. We would always start the session with trying to optimise the posture or the body or get back to as close to postural optimum as we can do before we start. And the reason for that primarily is one, reduce risk of injury. But two, like Dave says, if we can start to get into better shapes, we're going to get guys who are going to go and compete in major championships, Paralympic Games, World Championships, whatever it might be. Um, every time they go in the gym, if they move 1% better, we get a little bit more dorsiflexion in the ankle during our squat movements, we get a little bit more shoulder range of movement during overhead patterns or whatever it might be. 1% better over four years, we get into a major. That's huge for us. And I, I look at those and go, well, if I want to train and get the most out of my training, because I'm a busy person, why wouldn't I take steps to do the same as what we do for people that are going to be performing at the elite end? Um, so that we always start with mobility work and we, let's term it as mobility rather than stretching because my idea would be where you've got dysfunction, so say my shoulders are tight because I've been driving a lot or I've done a lot of work in the gym and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty kind of like just jacked up around the shoulders and feeling a little bit grotty. Loosening those out is going to be beneficial for my session. If I'm not going to train squats I don't really need to worry about a calf so I would target particularly about the things that I'm going to do so if it's a low body session mobilize low body if it's upper body go for the upper body self myofascial release we've got we've got a few videos in our beginners book about that yeah. and there's quite a bit on the internet that we've put on our YouTube channel around myofascial release and mobility um, so that would be like five minutes for me and I think the other thing is like stretching comes in many different forms and I won't go into what the research says about stretching because it's basically inconclusive not that it doesn't work, we just don't fully know as a scientific community know exactly how it works. So what I would tend to do, my stuff looks like my fascial release, get rid of some tension, and then mobility rather than stretching. So I might look to just kind of grease a movement pattern. And by that I mean just kind of like hanging out in some shape, starting to like almost just put a little bit of like grease on the, on the movement pattern, starting to get in some different shapes, rather than just hanging out in a static position. Like Dave says, that static shape and static holds could decrease power output. It's not what I want before I go into a session. So mobilize, grease the joint, get into the session, and then at the end of it, ideally, if you've got tired, that's when I would do my longer hold of static stretching. Or it fits in on a different day where you're going to do recovery work. If you've got a Sunday, you just want to do something, sit, stretch out, mobilize through. I completely sympathise and appreciate what you're saying because I have the same thing. Like I don't do as much mobility or stretching work as I would like. It's often confined around my sessions because I just don't. I just don't have. I don't find the time, and maybe that's a poor excuse. Yeah, but, but that's reality for a lot of us. Like we either can't find the time, we don't think we have the time, or yeah. other things take priority. And there's probably more important things going on in your life than like how. Great, your stretching routine. And if you're training a lot, like adding 10 minutes of stretching and doing something to bring that system back down to some base level, you just come and done a hard session yeah. in the gym, actually spending some time giving some starting that recovery process, I think has great long term benefits. But we don't do it, do we? We finish the last set, shirt on, backpack out of the gym on the way. Oh, home. Why, did you have your shirt off when you were training? Jumper on, <laughs> <laughs> hoodie on. But um, yeah, we're in a rush to get home a lot of the time. So, long answer to a, to a question, but it's a really. Uh, it's not conclusive and, and I think 
My take home message is definitely get that myofascial release in five minutes before you start. Don't do half an hour because again, negative. Mobilize some of the tight tissues that you've got specifically around what you're going to do and then recovery based or stretching at the end of a session. And that all fits into our framework. We have this whole section called movement preparation, getting ready for the session you're about to do. Um, and that's kind of how it all fits in together. Yeah, and, great sh- question. and that should be specific to what they're going to do. That's yeah. one thing you touched on that, um, that is important. There's no point in, like you use great examples, there's no point in releasing off your lower body if you're just going to do an upper body session. Yeah. But equally, depending on what your upper body session is, try and make something specific to that. Yeah. Um, great. So, the last question um, is a great question. It comes from Zombie7442, and it was on our last oh. video. If you look at the last video we did, with this partner <laughs> dragon, this partner on. dragon flag, <laughs> and he asked, and this is where like if it, uh, someone's doing a dragon flag, and Tim's got his knee, uh, his back on my knees, and he's holding onto arm, and he's out. Um, defying gravity, and uh, Zombie7442 asks, "Can I do this with a blow-up doll?" <laughs> um, I, I, I actually wrote that back and I, I was like, I, I saw that comment and I was like, well, no. I think my, my exact quote was, whatever tickles your fancy. And I mentioned I would, it to Dave and he's got a much better well, take on it. Than yeah, that, well, I, I think he's obviously asking he or she or it or whether it's even, it might just be a robot, um, asking, <laughs> um, you get them on the internet, is uh, asking a stupid question and I'm going to reply with a very scientific, non-stupid answer. Um, because of the mechanics of what you're doing, if you the, like, which position do you want the blow up doll to be? Because if he's going to be um, doing the being Tim in our example, do it going out in the dragon flag, and I'm going to lean back, the blow up dolls are going to weigh hardly anything, so I've got no leverage to lean back against, so it's not going to work like that. Um, if it's going to be the other way around, and you're going to put your back on the knees of a blow up doll and think it's going to be able to hold you up, then you're also going to, um, you've got absolutely no chance. So even though Tim did officially reply on it via text saying whatever floats your boat, um, the answer is no, you can't do that with a blow up doll. Hard, find... And that is a hard science answer, I like that. You're going to have to no. find something else to do with it. No, you can't. <laughs> so yeah, keep your blow up doll for your other activity. You can use, there's other things that you what probably you want to do. What you do outside of your calisthenics yeah, exactly. training. Then. I don't that think is, it's appropriate to, to merge the two that on that. Well, on that for that example, it isn't. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you were wanting to do, say, um, uh, hand like where you stand up and like you've got your partner doing a handstand yes. on top of your hands, you could do that with a blow up doll. That would be great. Yeah, perfect. That would be a really good oh, example yeah, yeah. to do that. Um, anyway, send an email to Cirque du Soleil and see if they'll have <laughs> it with that. They probably, they probably would. I think. Yeah. I mean, I'd pay to see. Different question. Anyway, yes, right, let's move on. Let's finish, let's just finish this off. Uh, if you haven't yet subscribed, uh, well, no, well, you can subscribe below or you can click up there. Um, if you haven't got our free beginner's guide, that's down there. And then if you missed out on last week's QA, HQ number four, that's over by Shall Tim's head. There you go. Over by Tim's head. So until next time, class dismissed.